Good morning. So good to see you all on this summer's day. I'm amazed any of you have turned out. I thought you'd have wanted to do church on the beach. Um, but you couldn't miss me, could you? That's what it was. <laughs> well, all those that are not here today obviously could. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, the rest of you are probably thinking, I wish I had the courage to miss today anyway. Um, we start a new season, a new season, a new series today, um, and it's got um, a very intricate title. It's called David. So hopefully you can remember the title, and um, it's really quite uh, an interesting aspect is to look at a biblical person's life and to glean some of the issues from that. There are far more issues and great things that you can get out of the life of David than I certainly will bring out. Um, there is just so many different aspects to David's life, but there are some things that run through his life and run through his, uh, his thinking that, that set him apart from everyone else. And, uh, and I want us to just to briefly have a look at those things. David is set in about the 11th century BC, and in the ancient, ancient times, um, their warfare was of a particularly gruesome nature. And um, they, um, they, they did things, and uh, the way that they fought in those days um, was particularly, I would say, we would look at it being quite barbaric. Um, Hollywood has tried to bring some of the sense of some of those things to us. We've seen Braveheart or Gladiator or those kind of things, but Hollywood can never really bring the true nature of that kind of warfare into, um, into our full understanding. We don't get the smells, uh, we don't get the, the uh, atmosphere, and certainly we don't understand the fear that would have been attached to these men that would go into battle, that would fight together. Um, it's a very different kind of warfare. We are used to seeing war through a camera lens. Um, we see war from maybe a helicopter view or a drone view uh, or a plane view or whatever it might be. So we, we, we are kind of, we can look at warfare, uh, even in our modern warfare, and we find that most of our modern warfare, certainly for many in our nation, uh, when we would maybe go into uh, various countries, like uh, they, they went into Afghanistan and many other things, is it's warfare at a distance. So often our planes can go in and they can bring destruction without ever having to face someone on the battlefield. This, this was different. This was, this was a battle where you would smell their breath. You would know what they had had for breakfast. Um, you know, it was done with uh, steel that was pretty blunt and wooden, um, uh, kind of whatever they call them, uh, buttons, whatever. They was, they was, it was very primitive. And, uh, and if you got injured, it was probably highly likely that you would die as a result. In fact, most of the time, the men would fight naked. And I know your ladies are thinking, oh, how gruesome. But they would, they would fight like that because if they, were, uh, they had a wound and their dirty clothes, the cloth that they were wearing went into the wound, it would infect the wound even worse. So they tried the hardest to, uh, to, you know, it, to, to avoid that because they knew that if they did get injured, it was highly likely they would. If they, if they did recover after the adrenaline had kind of come, come over, and they'd got past the kind of the adrenaline of things and then realized that they were severely bleeding, um, they would, if they could manage to, like you say, survive that, then they would often die of disease. But um, 
if they were left for dead, which for many were, even before they died, often the birds would come and start eating them. And uh, so I just I hope I'm trying to give you an idea of the gruesomeness of ancient warfare. Now, how about that for a sermon intro? Eh? This is the scene in which the time that David lived, a time when warfare was not just about shooting like a marksman at a distance. This was face-to-face, hand-to-hand combat in which you knew that if you were a newbie on the field, it was highly likely that you weren't coming home. You were going to face warriors, hardened, seasoned, professional warriors who, who knew how to kill, and uh, you would be on that kind of... And David enters into this scene as someone who had no battle experience, no military experience, no fighting experience at all. And so this is where we see the story that I want us to start off in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I'll just read some of the verses. Now the Philistines, from verse 1, gathered their forces for war and assembled at Asoko in Judah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle lines to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. In other words, they reckon he was about three meters tall, nine foot, nine inches tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor, a bronze weighing 5,000 shekels, which is probably about 125 pound, or if you're into kilograms, 58 kilograms. On his legs, he wore bronze, uh, uh, bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. This was like a stabbing spear, would have weighed about 15 pounds. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you are the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul, the king of Israel, and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. This challenge of Goliath had gone on for weeks. It was at least a month at this time that he had come out and he had taunted Israel, bring out your best. Bring out the one who who is to challenge me. Now, the people, of course, looked to their king, Saul, for him to go and fight Goliath. Or they looked to him, because he was the king, to make a decision. He was their leader and they're looking to him as their saviour. That's they put their hope in Saul. He is their leader. And that is where their hope lay, in Saul. Now the problem was is that Saul was nowhere to be seen. Uh, He was kind of in his tent. He was kind of with his soldiers around and he was looking for someone who would go uh, in his place. Now the thing is, is we've got to remember that where we place our hope is what we depend on. It's important to realize that the where you put your hope. And when we put our hope in a person, that's the one that we are depending on in times of problems. Yes? So it might be something. You might have your hope in something rather than in someone. But wherever your hope is, that is where 
you are depending on in points of, in times of need. And so the issue is that when people de de disappoint us that we are depending on, it can cause all sorts of issues in our life. So for example, we have more potential to be upset with the people who are closest to us. So for example, if we depend on our parents, which we do as children, we, our hope is in our parents, that they are the ones that can disappoint us the most and the people that then when they disappoint us, we can get very angry with them. We can get, it comes out in all sorts of ways, doesn't it? That we, we look at our parents, for example, and think, well, they should have done this. They should have defended us. They should have been there. They should have helped us or whatever it might be. So they have the greatest amount of opportunity to disappoint us, don't they? Because that's where our hope is. For example, I never put any hope in the family and the parents that lived across the road from us. The people that, uh, that lived across the road, the, our next door neighbours, the people down the street, I didn't, I didn't get disappointed with them because I didn't have any hope in them. I wasn't dependent on them. And you as parents understand that, don't you? You know, we understand as our children that they get disappointed. Sometimes you may have children now that are disappointed with you, or they're angry at you, or they're, they're kind of upset, and they're, they're frustrated with you. And you know what's amazing is, is you, 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 someone else, can, your neighbours across the road can have your children, and they bring the children back and go, oh, they are so well behaved. Oh, what lovely, lovely children you've got. And you're checking to see whether or not they brought your children back because it must be somebody else's children because your hope, because their hope was in you. They're disappointed with you. They give you a hard time. They, they get frustrated with you. Why? Because they're looking to you. They're not looking to these. They're just, they're on good behavior. And so often that happens to us in our own life as well, yes? And so we've got to be, be conscious of this. And so Saul was the one that was being looked to for their hope of Israel. He was their king and for he was very conspicuously absent from his place where he should have been, yes? His credibility was slipping away every day that Goliath came out and said, send a man. Now you've got to remember, Saul was picked to be king because he was head and shoulders above everyone else in Israel. In other words, Saul was Israel's giant. He was the best that they had. He was, he was chosen to be king. So he was not just their leader, he was their giant. So when he wasn't facing them, they're all going, well, what are we going to do? Where are we going to do this? And so we've got to understand that, that this is the whole backdrop of where we are. You see, God never intended Israel to have a king. He never wanted them to have a king because he wanted to be their king. He said, I am your king and I want you to understand this. Now, God intended Israel to be a theocracy. Now, for those of you who are doing the daily Bible reading with, uh, with Nicky Gumbel that many of us are doing. Today's reading was on our very text in Samuel, talking about democracy and theocracy and all the different forms of government and God's design. It was, I wake up to that thinking, wow, isn't it amazing how God just puts things together? You see, God established Israel as a theocracy because he wanted them to be ruled by his law and by the people that he would put as judges in the land. That's what his desire was. In other words, they were going to look to God for salvation. They were going to look to God for rescue. They were going to look to God to provide for them. And God's whole aim was, I want, you to, I want to show to you and I want you to understand that, that you have got a purpose and a plan that, uh, that, that is mine. And so that's what God had. So God wanted to be the king. 
but they insisted on having their own king. This was the problem. They wanted that. Why? Because, well, the problem was he's Samuel, who in some ways was the leader. He was the prophet. He was the judge of the time. And, uh, and he handed over to his children. He handed over to his sons. Now, his sons were not good judges. They were not good leaders. They didn't follow the Lord. They did all sorts of, of things. And we'll just read about that uh, in, a, in a moment. So, that's what God wanted. He wanted them to understand that he wanted to be king. That he wanted to be the final authority in the land, not someone else, that they wouldn't look to Saul, they wouldn't look to anybody else, but they would look to God as their source. Now, the thing is, is the difficulty is they had come out of lots of years of being in bondage and slaves to Egypt, and Egypt had a king. They had Pharaoh. And so, when God did this to Israel and he wanted to be their king, the, it, was, it was going completely against, it was years ahead of anything that would ever come uh, uh, in, in afterwards because of this. Because God had already seen that a king and a human king can never be one to put your hope in. And so he didn't want to raise a king. He didn't want us looking to a man for our salvation, for our rescue, for our help, for our provision. He wanted us to always look to that. But they insisted on having a king. And it says in 1 Samuel chapter 8, When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's judges. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old. That's not the only thing they said to him. And your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to leaders such as all the other nations have. We want to be like everyone else. I don't know if you heard of our children go, but so-and-so has this, and so-and-so has that. Do you know what I mean? They're always wanting, and even as adults, we're often wanting what we see other people have. We're looking for what they've got, and we think, oh, yeah, I need that. If I had that in my life, then I would be better off. Then I would feel secure, and I would, whatever uh, that, that, it, that it is to us. But they had forgotten that God had established Israel for a purpose, a specific purpose. God had a specific agenda and plan for Israel that was different to every other nation on earth. And the problem was they kept forgetting the original remit that God gave them. When God called Abram, who is the father of the nation of Israel, he said to them in Genesis chapter 12, he said, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and then he says this, and all nations on earth will be blessed through you. In other words, God's agenda for Israel was not that you would just be blessed, but that the surrounding nations would see that I am blessing you, you're prospering, you're doing so well, you're not living in fear, that everything's going well, so that the other nations would say, who is your God? They wanted, God wanted the nation of Israel to be a witness, to be ones that would be living examples of people trusting God. That was the thing, and so they have forgotten it this time, and so they're crying out for a king because they wanted to be like everyone else. But when they said this, verse 6, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel, so he prayed to the Lord. Always a good thing to do. And the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. And then it goes into some of the list. In other words, he'll demand your sons that they become soldiers in his army and that they serve him. He'll demand your daughters that they serve in the palace. He'll demand your land and he'll take your land and he'll want you, you'll have to give a percentage of your land and all this kind of stuff. And he warned them, but they still turned around and said, we want a king. 
we want a king. And that was where the story of David really enters into. Because, it, 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 in other words, this sets the scene for David, who would become a king who understood who was the real king. He never lost perspective, and it's the story of David who says that even though he knew one day he would become king, and when he did become king, he never lost the perspective and the right perspective that he needed to have. How he got it, we don't know, but he had this perspective that no one else seemed to have, and certainly Saul never had, and they enabled him to be and to do things that he wouldn't be. He was a reluctant hero. He didn't go into this saying, I want to be a hero. He went into this just being David. He was a shepherd boy. At this stage, he was probably about 15 years of age. And he's, he's, all he's done is watch sheep. But you see, he's done it faithfully. He's done it in a good way. He's done the small stuff when no one else was watching and he did things which no one else was doing. The normal shepherds and everybody else wouldn't do what he did. But he did it because of what was in his heart, because of he knew the principle of this, because he never confused his identity with God's identity. He never confused his identity and his calling with, what, with what, who God was. And who God is. That Israel's true king is God Almighty. And so even when he ended up with military success, he had power and popularity um, and all those things that went on, he never lost sight of the fact that God is king. That God is the one that he was going to put his uh, focus on. You see, success confuses the best of us. A little bit of success and then the next thing you know, we're on the throne of our own lives. A little bit of success, a little bit of sales success, a little bit of family success, a little bit of financial success, a little bit of parenting success, a little bit of academic success. And suddenly we think, I've done this. I have acquired this. I put my hope in my abilities and my skills and the way that I can do things. And it's so easy to do. Every time we do that, we get some success and it conf we get confused and we, we miss what it's all about. And so we catch our first glimpse of David's unusual perspective while he was a shepherd boy. 1 Samuel 17, it says this, On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now David shows up with a little care package for his older brothers. He's got three brothers there. And he comes with like packed lunch and stuff and he was going regular with them. He was probably using any excuse he could to kind of see the, the fight, uh, to see what was going on. And so he hears Goliath's taunts and he, at this point he comes in it after Goliath has been taunting Israel for about a month. Yes, and not just once a day, but twice a day. Goliath was giving Israel their daily devotions, morning and evening. They were, he was saying, this is, this is what I want you to hear. This is what I want you to understand that, uh, that you need to, uh, need to recognize uh, who I am and who we are. Yes? But David, when he hears this, instead of being dismayed and terrified, he's offended. He doesn't get afraid of what the taunts. He's offended, yes? And so he questions the real uh, mindset of, of what others have got. In other words, he reveals the fact that his mindset is different to everybody else's. In verse 26, he says, David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Palestine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Can you see the difference in thinking? He's not thinking, oh no, who's going to go and why isn't the king going? He's not looking at any of that. He's just going to say, but what's the reward? Yeah, and so this is the kind of thing. Now, you, I've got to imagine the situation, 15-year-old boy. 
He's with his brothers. He's with the men of war, seasoned men, warriors that knew how to fight. They have the, the stare of death in their eyes. They were, and they're looking at David and going, what? We haven't thought about that. All we see is a nine foot nine inch giant. We never thought about the fact that he's a Philistine, he's uncircumcised, that he's not, he's not in God's plan and God's not got a plan for his life and that he's out of God's plan and he's making demands that God said he should never make, that he's asking for land that belongs to Israel because God gave them that land. He, he, they haven't seen that. It's never appeared for them. They're not asking that question. That he's outside of God's covenant. He's not the one that should be doing that. And so word gets to Saul, the things that David's saying. Now you can imagine Saul in his tent and he hears, oh, there's this, there's this, 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 this guy called David and, uh, and he wants to know if he can fight the, fight the giant. And Saul is probably thinking, oh, at last a volunteer. <laughs> at last I've got somebody who will go. And then, of course, David appears to him and then he sees that he's a runt of a boy and he, is, he, can, he tries to him, he says, well, what are you going to do? And so he puts his armor on him and it kind of drowns him and he can't walk with the, with the, with the armor. And he tries to think, and so you can imagine Saul's got despair and thinking it can't happen. It's not going to happen. But then David's not put off by the fact that Saul won't do what he's meant to be doing. He's not put off by the fact that Saul and the others were probably laughing at him and thinking, what are you going to do? No, he starts to give his resume. He starts to say, yes, but. And he goes on, he says, I might have no military experience. I might have no weapons, but. And then in Samuel 17, verse 36, your servant has killed both a lion and a bear. How many of you have done that? I've killed a lion and a bear. Instead of doing what most shepherds would do, which would be to do a runner or to say, oh, what a shame. He, you know, can you imagine David saying, oh, well, sorry, Dad, but a lion came today and he, uh, he pinched one of the lambs and Dad going, oh, never mind, son. You know, as long as you're all right. But he didn't. He just went, that's me, Dad's sheep. You're not having it. And he used his sling and he would kill the lion and the bear. Yeah. It's amazing when you think about it. And so then he goes on to say, this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. <laughs> he goes after the lion and gets the sheep back. Goes after the bear and gets the sheep back. And all he's saying is, he's just like a bear. And I've already done a lion and a bear, so who's he? So can you understand he comes in with this because his trust is not in his ability. He's not thinking, I'm an SAS warrior when he walks in. He's saying, who defies the king of Israel? Who defies God? And so he has this different perspective. He has extraordinary clarity on the issues at hand. And we've got to remember every battle that we face is an opportunity for us to trust God and to say, God, your will be done. God, I want to be part of the fight. I'm on your side because I know that you're going to win. That's the issue, isn't it, of recognizing where we are. And then he goes on, he says, he's defied the armies of the living God, verse 37. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. Isn't that absolutely amazing? So David's assumption is the, this, this assumption that he has that God will fight that God will bring victory because he's an uncircumcised, out of God's plan person, yes, that, be, that, that carries this for the rest of his life. For all his life, he has this sense that God is in control and that he is king. And so even though he knew he was anointed to be king, and even later when he became king, he never lost his perspective that God was his king. And so David's going, so pick me, choose me, I want to go. Can you imagine that? I wonder how many of us would have said, pick me. I'd have been going, oh yeah, yeah, pick him, pick him. Hey, uh, it's all, it's all, you know. Because we don't have that perspective. Now the beauty we have of David's life, which we don't get anywhere else, is that King David wrote about his experiences. He didn't just write 
the historical account. We don't just get to know what happened. We get to know how he felt and how he thought through these issues. That's why we have the Psalms. The Psalms are David's way of expressing. He was a poet. He was a musician. He was so talented and skilled. And, but yet, in all of that, he still looked to God. And that's what he's doing every day. He's saying, you are my king. You are my hope. You are the one that I trust in. You are the one that's got it together. It's your side I'm on. And I'm, I want you to be uh, on my side in the battle. So it's so, that's why we read the Psalms so wonderfully, because we get to get inside of David's mind and heart, of who he is and how he thinks. Because you see, you can be, see someone who does some great exploits, whatever it might be, but if you want to know how that person is, because you can never be that person, but what your key is to do is to get into that person's mind. If you know how they think, then you can think the same. And that's the issue today, is can we think how David thought? Can we have that perspective, that life-transforming change in our thinking that changes everything about us? And one of the Psalms that he wrote is Psalm 25, and it's verses 1, 3, and 5 I want to look at. It's a phenomenal Psalm. In verse 1 he says, In you, Lord, my God, I put my trust. In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Did you get it? In you, O oh Lord, I put my trust. That's what David was saying. And he, he was in him. He was ingrained in him. It's not in my power. It's not in my leadership ability. Not in my ability to persuade. It's not in my influence. It's not in my affluence. It's in none of those things. My hope is in you. And so even as king, he got it to hope in God. And I want you to know that that is a posture that God wants for every single one of us. That's the posture he wanted for the whole nation of Israel. He wanted them to be able to say, in you I put my trust and my hope is in you all day long. Isn't that fantastic? He was clear-eyed, he was confident, and yet he was humble. And you can imagine him there making his way down to the valley of Elah. Uh, you can imagine the, what the Philistines doing because he's got has to come down the valley to, 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 to meet Goliath. And so you can imagine the Philistines and they're going, he's only a boy. Do they know they're doing? Where's his weapons? You know, he, for all the things, you can imagine the Philistines having a right good laugh. Can't you? Now, can you imagine on the other side of Israel and all the army of Israel looking and going, so sending a boy. What is this? He's not a weapon. He's not armed. He's never fought before. We're going to lose. Can you see the, the whole thing? The, the, the bigger picture of what's going on here, that when David goes into this, he sees clearly, he acts confidently, and he walks humbly before his God. And if you and I will put our hope in God, we will see clearly, we will act confidently, and we will walk humbly before our God. That's what he's looking for. So today, if you think I can't see clearly, then you need to get your hope in the one that's worth putting your hope in. I believe that with all my heart. I believe that's so important. So David waits. He's there with Goliath. And this is what David <laughs> says to Goliath. 15-year-old boy, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Can you imagine David? You can imagine the voice. He's not going, hey, oh, hey, you know, you've, you've defied him. It's not, you know, it's not... He isn't he ain't being gentle with this. You can imagine a 15-year-old boy. There's such courageousness, such courage, such confidence in God. This day, because this is what's great, he points out to Goliath what's about to happen. He tells him, he says, This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. It's a bit like two boxers, isn't it? And they're threatening each other. 
But he goes in, he says, This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into my hands. And then he kills Goliath. Just gives it, dong, sorted. Yeah? Cuts his head off, sorted, job's done. Instantly David becomes famous. And he becomes instantly feared by the Philistines. And that day, the the Philistines made a big mistake because they ran. They turned and ran. And so Israel, the army just went after them and they slaughtered. He says that all day they slaughtered the Philistines. That's pretty gruesome, isn't it? Yeah. All day. In other words, the battle was clearly the Lord's all through one little boy. Reminds you of the feeding of the 5,000 with a few little bits and pieces, yes? With God. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your ability. It doesn't matter your, your context. It doesn't matter how, how intelligent you are. It doesn't matter anything. It's all about where is your trust? Will you trust in the Lord? Because if you do, you will see clearly. You will act confidently. And you will be humble. People who are, are like this, they wake up on the morning and they declare like David did. In you, O oh Lord, I put my trust and my hope is in you all day long. Can you imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning with that declaration? Can you imagine if in the midst of maybe this week or whatever way you are, the successes that you've had, the triumphs, the things that have gone well, the blessings, all the stuff that's gone on and In the midst of that, you're able to say, in you, O Lord, I put my trust. I put my hope in you all day long. But you see, you say, well, it's easy to put your trust in the Lord when things are going right. What about when things are not going right? What about when things have been gone patient? When there's there's pain and when there's hurt and things have disappointed and not turned out the way they are. That's when you need to be like David and get up in the morning. And say, in you, O Lord, I trust. My hope is in you all day long. That sets the men from the boys. Yes, in mentality. It sets us apart from all other people. Is having that kind of perspective that God wants us to have. I remember when I was preparing this, I was thinking of Helen. Many of you know Helen. Helen was... One who was just, had trust in God. She loved God and served God. She had breast cancer. She had hip replacement. She had womb and stomach cancer. She fostered over a hundred children from broken homes. She was at the center of everything we did as a church long before Kath and I came. She cleaned. She did the catering. She did the cafe. She did centre hires. She did the, uh, the, the stuff for weekends and church weekends away. She did the admin. She was secretarial. She was, uh, she was integral to our Women of Destiny ministry. She was a ke- connect group leader for many years. She had the dis- discipleship track. She would do it over and over and over again. She was amazing. It's a, every pastor's perfect um, Remember, eh? She was, she was in everything. She was extravagantly generous. She knew the heartbreak of losing loved ones and people that she knew in church moving on. She served, she loved, and she was faithful to the core. And if you were to cut Ellen open, it would say, in you I trust, O oh Lord. My hope is in you all day long. My question to you this day is, What can you do this week to grow your trust in the Lord? What can you do? Because I believe if you will do something like that and say today, I'm going to do something, I'm going to do some way of trusting the Lord, I want to tell you, you will be able to see clearly, act confidently, and walk humbly before your God. Amen.